Hello everybody out there, this is DJ McClanahan coming to you once again. Today in the studio I have an actor with me. We're going to be doing an actor interview today, getting away from the interview with casting directors for just a bit. I will return to that, however. But today I'm going to be talking with an actor by the name of Paul McCrane. Paul just got done doing a really, really long run of the great play The Iceman Cometh. Paul, I'm glad you joined me here today. Welcome to my show. Well, thanks, DJ. I appreciate the invitation. Paul, you're one of those actors that even though you do film and you've had some success in television and other kinds of things like that, you still do theater. You have a love for the stage. You're one of those gritty kinds of guys that uh, I really appreciate as an actor myself. Oh, wow, DJ. I didn't know you were an actor. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's, you could say that's my uh, main passion, you know. I, I love broadcasting, too, but broadcasting's more of a job, even though I do enjoy it, you know. Okay. Well, I guess you learn something new every day. Paul, when we spoke on the phone, you talked about going off to work. <laughs> and the way you put it, you had such a working man's attitude that I imagine you head into the theater with your lunch pail. Yeah, with the show I'm doing right now, it's, it's really like that. I'm in the theater about six hours every night. I'm on all but about 20 minutes of the first act and 15 minutes of the second act. Uh, so, total of about four hours. Wow, that's a, it's quite, a, quite a time to be spending on stage. So what do you think about when you're on stage that long? It depends on how it's going that night. Sometimes I'm thinking about how bad it's going. <laughs> it's, it's funny, this, this, this play taught me a lot about acting. Uh, I, I made um, some mistakes in the way that I approached it right from the start, which, unfortunately, I'm still compensating for. I was intimidated by the material and the company I was working with, uh, probably because I was out of work for seven months before this. To go through that kind of an experience is uh, it's a little bit demoralizing. Yeah, I'm sure it is. And how did that affect your work in Iceman? Well, I spent a lot of the early period of rehearsal and performance kind of proving that I was a good actor. It got in the way of doing the work of sitting down, looking at the play, and really deducing what this character is about, and, you know, also what he wants and what's in his way. Instead, I spent some rehearsal time aborting my instincts in the um, well-meaning but mistaken attempt to do something good right now. Rather than following the recipe I know works, I, I jump steps. I, um, I placed these other people I was working with up there, and I felt I had to keep up with them. So, in the first performances, I think it's fair to say that I was making a lot of noise. I'll tell you the truth. When I, when I read this play the first time, I could feel it, but I didn't understand it. The play is so long, and I, I grew up not reading very much, unfortunately, and now I'm paying for it. I should have read the whole play three to five times before rehearsal, and at least once a week during rehearsal. I, um, I, I worked on the individual scenes, but because I didn't have a really solid grasp of the whole, I would find things that worked in those scenes, but then the next scene would come up and I'd be left hanging. This is the longest run I've done so far, about 12 weeks. Before, I don't think I was able to appreciate the rewards of working on difficult material and a, a, a very interesting character for a long period of time. Now, I really am aware of the subtleties you can reach and the depth of understanding not only a character but parts of yourself. I think karmically that's why film pays so much, at least in monetary terms. Because yeah, yeah, in film you get you get more money, but you don't get the other kinds of rewards that you get in theater. In film you shoot a scene in one day and that's the last time you do it. Even though you do it over and over again, you're doing it in the span of twelve hours as opposed to um, living with the material for five months. You can look at it like this. If I take a napkin and put it over this cup and leave it there, at the end of the day it might have sagged a little bit. Give it about six months and let all the weather and the rain come down on it, and that napkin's pretty much going to have the shape of that cup. You know what I'm saying? You, you get the subtler dimensions of the material just from exposure for that length of time. Yeah, I like that, uh, I like that analogy you use. So did you... Um did you always want to be doing what you're doing now? Did you, always, did you always want to be an actor? I did. And then I didn't for a while. I was a senior in high school when I did Landscape of the Body, and it burnt me out, 
trying to go to high school and traveling back and forth to Bucks County. I never saw my friends. After that, I was exhausted. I spent the summer puttering around lawns down in Pennsylvania, and in the fall, I got a call to audition for Runaways as a replacement. I got that part, so I moved to New York. I see. And what made you decide to go ahead with acting? To be really honest, I didn't know what else to do with myself. I had registered for college, and I just didn't want to go. I didn't want to stay where I was, and I, I didn't know what else to do with myself. This offer to do a play on Broadway came along, and I said, well, yeah, I guess I'll do that. I'd been in school plays, and my dad acts in local theater in Philadelphia, so I ran lights and stuff for them. That was really my first exposure I had to the professional theater. I have studied and continue to study with Uta Hagen at HB Studios. And she's just brilliant. She's, she's so incisive without falling into the trap of thinking that because we're actors, we're superior beings. She's great for young actors to be around because a lot of us, if we're, if we're trying to take it seriously and be taken seriously, we can get really just so self-important. Uh, at one time, I approached acting like a religion. I, I really, I really, really did. Uh, you know, the work. Now, believe me, I don't for a minute mean to ridicule acting. I know some people who take it so lightly that it makes me angry, but it's not a religion for me any longer. All right, I, yeah, I get that. I get that. So, uh, wh why did you, why were you motivated to act in the first place? I love to pretend. But if I'm really honest, I, I think I wanted to be close to my dad. My dad loved acting, still does. It was something I saw him doing and I knew he liked and I wanted to be a part of that. Then how does he feel about your career? How does, how does dad feel about that? He's really proud of me. He's a little jealous sometimes. All right, let's move to a different issue here. You, you've played a lot of gay characters. Uh, have, have you worried about being typed? Well, you know, it's funny. I've only played three or four gay characters, but I did two films where the characters were gay, and that's what sticks in people's minds. It has been, at times, a source of minor frustration, I'm sorry to admit, because well, I, I'd like to think that it's unimportant. But, for instance, I don't often get offered roles outright without having to audition, yet the majority of things for which that happens are gay roles. It's to that degree that I'm shying away. Right now, career-wise, unless I played a real queen, it wouldn't be a good idea for me to play a homosexual character. I'm interested in being thought of for other kinds of characters. Time to move on. Even with the Hotel New Hampshire, there was some discussion with my agent whether it would be a good career move for me to do that. I decided to do it, finally, because I thought it was an interesting character and a really interesting project. It sounds like at some point you developed a self-conscious attitude about yourself as an actor. Was there a turning point? I was always self-conscious, but after fame came out, I became famous for a while, and there's an odd distortion that happens. It's an unusual experience to walk down the street and have strangers stop and look at you with, with awe, and buy you drinks, and buy you meals, invite you to their restaurants. It really distorts your sense of yourself. I did a lot of thinking about this, and, and I have a theory. When's the last time in your life when everywhere you went, people looked at you as if there was something awesome about you? Well, it happens to me every day. <laughs> ah, just, just a little joke there. Well, well seriously. Well, the last time that it happened, when, when you thought that uh, everywhere you went, people looked at you as if there was something great, something special about you, the last time it happened was when you were a kid, a, a little boy, a, a, a baby, a child. When we're little kids, we have a lot of fantasies about the world. Let's say as a little kid, I had fantasies that I could fly. As I got older and became more mature, I had to go through the disappointment of realizing that I can't really fly. Well, suddenly, when everybody starts looking at you like that, it triggers all those childhood fantasies. You think, well, maybe I can fly. Maybe I really am the center of the universe. Everywhere I went for a while, it was getting reinforced. And that's when I started becoming more self-conscious, because I liked the reflection I was getting, but if I couldn't fly, maybe they wouldn't look at me with awe anymore. And the fact was, I couldn't fly. One of the reasons The Iceman Cometh has been a good experience is that I got singled out in the New York Times Review as being essentially the only bad thing in an otherwise brilliant production. But really, it was in some ways a nightmare come true. There's no question that it hurt my ego, but in some way it calmed the hell out of me. 
I didn't fall apart. I didn't go to the theater hanging my head and hiding. In a way, my biggest fear was being exposed as the only lousy thing in a brilliant play. And there it was. And look, I survived. I'm still here. Oh, yes, you are. But not for long, because we're out of time. <laughs> It's been great having you in here. I really appreciate your time. Again, uh, folks, we have been talking to uh, actor Paul McCrane. So uh, we do appreciate you tuning in. And, Paul, of course, I appreciate you stopping by and talking with me. All you actors out there, I hope you found this beneficial. Until next time, have yourselves a wonderful day. And this is DJ McClanahan signing off.